Hi there, welcome to today and hope you've all had a wonderful week and that it's been a blessed one filled with lots of love and uh, as we go into today's message we're just going to go a little bit deeper into some of the teachings that we've been fortunate and blessed enough to be able to go through in the last few weeks and uh, as we go into today's scripture we're going to be talking about how how we live by faith but before we do so let's give our time to the Lord dear Heavenly Father we thank you for today Lord Lord, we, th we thank you for every day that you give us, and we ask that you be with us every step of the way as we go into your scriptures. Open this uh, wonderful word of life that you give us. Speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit, and give us the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation, so that we may be able to continue abiding in you. We pray this in your Holy Son's name, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so as I said, we're going to be looking at how we walk in faith, and Today is going to be a message of um, the uh, just that walk by faith and the steadfastness as we go into uh, our walk with the Lord. And we're going to be opening up in uh, Hebrews 10, which uh, speaks of the animal, animal sacrifices being insufficient. But it allows us to appreciate the new covenant sanctuary and our steadfastness in our faith. You know, the Le Levitical sacrifices were... Uh, made perfect every year and that was why they went every year to get the atonement for our sins but um, through Christ and his blood that he shed on the cross there was no need for the annual uh, sacrifices and uh, all those things that happen because we have an eternal destination that we've been given that assurance of through the cross but it does remind us the worshippers the believers that we can walk in this victory and we are cleared from the conscious of the shadow as we continue to look to the substance. Now Hebrews 10, chapter 5, verses 10, speaks of Christ's death that fulfills God's will. And if we open up with that passage of Scripture, we can get going into the Word of God. So Hebrews uh, chapter 5, verses 10, Therefore when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you do not desire, nor had pleasure in them. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that, will, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. It goes to show that he came to do this once and for all, for all of us. But we've got to turn our hearts back to him, appreciate what he's done on the cross, because Christ's offering of death was the perfect sanctification for us. You know, the Old Testament, uh, uh, those that were offering sacrifices were ineffective in their sacrifice offerings. But with the new covering and the new covenant at Calvary from what Christ did on the cross, he allowed us to wait for that manifestation of his triumph over victory, over all the enemies that he has. Remember, he said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Holy Spirit is at work and has been at work throughout the millennia, the thousands of years. And even through Jeremiah, God works a good thing, providing new desires for his will. The old covenant brings reminders of sin, but the new covenant brings real forgiveness. And then we can walk in that. We can appreciate that. And even through Jeremiah, we appreciate that the Holy Spirit enabled the prophet to announce the new covenant that was there for us to appreciate, or those in his days to look forward to, enabling believers to understand the importance of Christ's sacrifice. So as we continue to walk in our faith journey, we appreciate that this is the covenant. This is the new covenant. And we read from chapter 10 of uh, Hebrews 16 to 18. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where, where there is remission of 
Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Appreciating for Christ's atoning work, once and for all, gone to the cross. And through him we both have access by, by spirit to the Father. One spirit to the Father. Last message we shared how John uh, 14 verses 6 says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Very interesting fact, truth, revelation, that when we appreciate his love for us, we can appreciate that we, as believers, have our eternal destination secured, but it's bringing other people into that same revelation. Why? There's a purpose for the mystery. In Ephesians, I love Ephesians. Ephesians, there's a great little uh, passage of scripture that I, I read, but that's not the focus for tonight. Very close to it, but not the focus. Because there's a purpose for the mystery. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 12, it says, In whom we have boldness and uh, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. So when we in him, we are allowed to express, manifest his good and pleasing will, his love, not only for us, but for others, worshipping from a true heart, giving us the access to his presence. With sincerity and purity, we do this. But this is based on the assurance of the, the blood of Christ, as found in Romans 5, verses 11. But it's also the, the cleansing, the continual cleansing, the sanctification of the word of God and the Holy Spirit through our lives. That's found a little bit later in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26. But our salvation will never, never fail or never waver as long as it's grounded. It's grounded on the faith and the fullness of one who promised. Remember the last message we spoke of the promise? But love for one another in Christ is the supreme and must be manifested in itself through works of love, through words of love, through deeds of love, through prayers of love, and through acts of love. It's all about love. It's all about love. Ephesians 5 verses 1 to 10 speaks of something else that can... Uh, sorry, not Ephesians, Matthew 5 verses uh, 1 to 10 speaks of something that gives us great comfort in times of difficulties and um, all these things that happen to us as born-again believers and those who love the Lord. You know, sometimes there's persecution, sometimes there's loss, sometimes there's grief, and sometimes there's mourning. And then there's joy. In a few, uh, Matthew chapter 5, it speaks of the Beatitudes. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a wonderful, I've just shared it with someone today, because, um, you know, they're remembering a, a loved one that's gone home to be with the Lord. And, you know, while we still work through that healing process after a loss of a loved one, that takes time and there's no specific uh, date or period that that, uh, that happens in. But it's an ongoing journey and that healing process of a, a loved one that's been lost can be found in Christ. Because he then mends the broken heart and he brings about the healing that maybe not we can do on our own. But there's three word wells that I want to cover in this passage of scripture. And the first one is blessed. Strong's Accordance 3107, from the root muck, indicating large or of long duration. The word is an adjective suggesting happy, supremely blessed, a condition in which congratulations are in order. It is a grace word that expresses the special joys and satisfaction granted the person who experiences salvation. So that's why when we pray for blessings, we pray that over our, our loved ones and those that uh, we know that the Lord has got a good plan for them. And us, because we were once we were once lost, but through his love, he came and found us. 
a word wealth merciful. Strong's Accordance 1655 is related to the words ilio, which is to have mercy, and ilios, which is active compassion, and iliomunsun, which is compassion for the poor. And ilimun is a kind of compassionate, sympathetic, merciful, and sensitive word combining tendencies with action. A person with this quality finds outlets for his merciful nature. The English word iliomusinary or charitable philanthropy relief finds its origin in this word. Now the next pair, uh, word wealth is pure, which is katheros. In Strong's Accordance 2513, without blemish, clean, undefiled, and pure. The word describes the physical cleansiness, ceremonial purity, and ethical purity. Sin pollutes and defiles, but the blood of Jesus washes that stain away. So as we appreciate those wonderful words, blessed, merciful, and pure, let's hold on to that truth that it says in the scripture, how we can be blessed in these areas, not only to ourselves, but to others. Let's turn our attention to a kingdom dynamic, because in the passage of scripture that I just read, it did say, blessed are the peacemakers. Now, what is this peacemakers peacemaking all about? It's all about reconciling, reconciliation. Jesus prioritized the ministry of human reconciliation in this statement, showing peacemaking as the birthright and the birth assignment of God's sons and daughters. Peace is often hard won. It comes at great cost to Jesus, who sacrificed his life that we might have peace. A peacemaker is willing to give up his perceived rights as he pursues a path of seeking and advancing harmony amongst other individuals, families, nations, so that they may be able to experience peace through God's love for them. We can become that kind of peacemaker if we are willing to walk in step with him and allow the Holy Spirit to empower us and to pour the love of God into our hearts and others. So let's be a peacemaker. But that's the call to unity. In our relationship with the Heavenly Father, we display our family likeness by manifesting the fruit of the Spirit of peace and in doing what is important to him is making peace. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And he also said, I must be about my father's business. His last will and testament was, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He came to bring peace, make peace through the blood of the cross, and cause us to be peacemakers. Peacemaking is the family business. We all need to share in this truth. We must have peace before we can become peacemakers. Peace is a sure sign we have accepted our reconciliation with our Heavenly Father. And peace is the result of a forgiving heart, now filled with Christ's Spirit. When peace rules in our heart, we can be peacemakers. Being a peacemaker means becoming the initiator in reconciling conflict between others and us. Our part in the family business is to tear down the walls that divide us and constantly work for understanding. And appreciation. In a world where people and groups are at odds, our calling is to actively seek to resolve conflicts. We can listen to, love, and care for others, those on each side, without taking any sides, because we stand on the third side, and that's the side of peace. Peacemaking means going into the family business, the business of God's family. What a wonderful truth that allows us to just remind ourselves that through the love that he poured out on us, we can extend that to others. Freely receive, freely give. But what happens if you get into a situation where you want to reach out for that reconciling and it doesn't come or it's not reciprocated? All we can do is put it at the Lord's feet and ask him to do what we can't. Ask him to work in that other person male or female, the family situation, community situation, or even the nation. Prayer with intercession is very powerful. But as we're also going to learn, we're going to appreciate the, the, the wonderful intimacy that we can have with the Lord by trusting in Him, waiting on Him, and being faithful to Him. 
God's a faithful God. And as soon as we appreciate how faithful he is to us and us reciprocating that to him, we can do that with others. We can hold them close, whether it's through a word, a deed, or even a prayer, but it helps us all on our journey. Going heavenly, heavenward, heavenward, <laughs> to our heavenly sanctuary. Why? Because God is love. God is in each and every single one of us. And if we can appreciate that, it will be a great opportunity to do great things, do great exploits. So as we continue with our um, message, going into the heart of the message, how the just shall live by faith, I want to go to Hebrews 10. But before I do that, I want to turn our attention to Habakkuk. Because Habakkuk taught us some great lessons, even if it was in the Old Testament. And when we appreciate how Habakkuk handled certain situations, he gives us some insights and key kingdom dynamics to um, hold on to, to appreciate. Because Habakkuk had some questions. He was looking around and there were things that were not of God and he couldn't understand why things were the way they were. And Habakkuk asked some questions, but he didn't ask the questions of the people around him. He asked the questions to the one who could give him the answer. And it was about the first one being about God's concern. He was questioning, God, are you not concerned about what's going on? Even asking, why don't you do something? But the answer was given. And the answer, I'll let you have a look through the beginning of Habakkuk to appreciate what the Lord said. And then he also asked about the methods that he would use. And asking, why does God use wicked men? To fulfill his purposes. Appreciating the frustration that he probably had back then. And then we look at our lives today and seeing things that uh, we want to we wanna help and uh, grow his kingdom. But we come against these things every now and then. It asks the question. But instead of complaining, instead of um, speaking a negative word. We silence the unbelief, but then we also pose our question to the Lord and just ask him. Now, God answers in wonderful ways. And sometimes it's through prayers. Sometimes it's through dreams and visions. And if we can appreciate what God is saying to us in these uh, instances, we can, we can allow to see what God is saying to us in our times. We've got to be careful, though, because sometimes if we have a dream, it may be misleading or misguiding, or we may completely mis. Uh, interpret the dream so we just really have to seek him when we have a dream if we have a dream go into the scriptures and ask him to reveal what that dream meant but in Habakkuk's answer or situation in chapters 2 verses 1 to 20 God's answer came through a number of means but what did the prophet Habakkuk have to do he had to wait that was the first discipline that he had to exercise and then, he, and then he appreciated that the Lord would respond. But it was the significance of the reply that allowed him to appreciate the answer that he was given from the Lord. Central to the truth of all believers that we can exercise and apply in our lives. But there's a kingdom dynamic that I want to I read uh, to you and then we'll just go through it again. This is now speaking of keys to hearing God's voice. This is a, an equipping session. A session to be able to get you uh, exercising that discernment and hearing God's voice. Because these come through dreams and visions. Hearing the voice of God is the birthright of a born again believer. Like Habakkuk, we can take posture before God that enables us to hear his voice. Number one, meet with the Lord regularly in a special place of prayer. Number two, look for God to speak to you in dreams and visions. Number three, listen for the word of the Lord. And number four, keep a journal of the things that God says. And number five, wait for God to bring it to pass. So let's recap that. Number one, meet. And with the Lord regularly meeting with him in a special place, it's almost like us saying, I'll stand my watch. And after we've met him, or gone into that meeting area, space, time. We look for God to speak to us in dreams and visions, which says, I will watch to see. 
And then after meeting him and looking at what he's going to say and how he's going to speak to us, we listen for the word of the Lord. So while we look and read in the word and hear, listen to him, listen to the word of the Lord, it'll be him saying, he will talk to us. He will say to me. And after we meet, after we look, after we listen, and after we keep, which is keeping a journal of the things that God says, which is writing the vision, we go to the fifth one, which is wait. Wait for God to bring it to pass as it would surely come. This all falls part of the exercise of um, discernment, uh, interpreting dreams and visions through the word of God, hearing him through what the Holy Spirit is saying, but also appreciating the vision. As in Habakkuk, he had a vision. And this comes under the leader traits. And leaders are men or women of prophetic vision who have a heart to receive and believe that God-given dreams are possibilities. The Bible shows the presence or the absence of a vision will determine whether or not people become lethargic or worse, cast off restraint, oblivious to the law. The presence of vision creates hope and brings change when articulated with enthusiasm. The prophet Habakkuk directs that vision is to be handled according to certain principles if people are to embrace it. The vision must, number one, be written down. So write the vision down. Number two, make it clear and make it plain. Number three, be motivating. Motivating to those who read it. That he who reads it may run with it. And further, wise leaders learn that vision A must be received with patience. In other words, wait for it. B has an appointed time. C is often delayed, it tarries. And D, its fulfillment will be certain. And then in verse 4 it says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. What does it mean when we live by faith? Strong's Accordance 2421, to live, to stay alive, be per, uh, preserved, to flourish, to enjoy life, to live in happiness, to breathe, be alive, be anim uh, animated, recover health, live consciously. The fundamental idea is to live and breathe, breathing being the evidence of life in the Hebrew concept. Hence the Hebrew word for living, being an animal and life, derived from the word shaya. And the verb occurs 250 times in the Old Testament. Many references contain the suggestion that living is the result of doing the right thing. The present reference is one of the giant pillars of faith. Not only does it appear several times in the New Testament, it also sparked the Reformation. It literally reads the righteous person in his faithfulness shall live, shall live through firmness, consistency, belief, faith, and steadfastness. So with that said, and appreciating what the Lord speaks to us in this passage, we can appreciate the eternal significance and the concerns in Hebrews. And we're going to turn our attention back to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 to 39. For if we sin willingly, willingly after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there shall no longer remain a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour, devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Oh, of how much worse punishment do you suppose we will be thought worthy, whose trampled Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again the Lord will judge his people. And then it carries on for a little while longer, speaking about a couple of things, which I want to touch on a couple. I want to touch on a few. Because the first one is um, appreciating that by faith we understand. We understand the... Uh, the dawn of history that allows us to appreciate what it is saying here. And, you know, 
we're all working towards our, our eternal destination. And yes, there's illnesses that come around. And yes, there's external factors and situations that prevent us from wanting to make great strides for the kingdom of God. But that's okay. Because it teaches us a couple of things. It, keeps, it teaches us the lessons of Habakkuk, which we can exercise. And we continue praying with intercession, not only over our own lives, our, our family's lives and community and church and business and uh, nation. But we do so in faith, hope and love. One of the most warnings against the apostasy in this passage of scripture is um, the one who willingly forsakes Christ. And if so, doing so means that there is no sacrifice for sin. But the, 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 the scriptures it testifies of God's judgment that brings certainty and absolute uh, in, in, in this passage of scripture. The writer in Hebrews encourages us to remain in him and remind us that uh, through the endurance, through the trials and tribulations, persecutions and errors, we can have that uh, compassion, not only for others, but ourselves, because we know that he's coming back for his bride. But there's a word that I just want to encourage us with, that endurance. Because a little bit later on, after reading the first few verses of chapter 10, verses 26 to 39, Verses uh, 35 and 36. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. There's that word promise again. But I just want to touch on the endurance word, word wealth. Strong's Accordance 5281. Constant, uh, con constancy, perseverance, continuance, bearing up, steadfastness, holding out patient endurance. The word combines the hupo, which is under, and mon, which is to remain. It describes the capacity to continue to bear up under difficult circumstances, not with a passive complacency, but with a hopeful, a hopeful fortitude that actively resists weariness and defeat. Remember the apparent defeats that I mentioned in previous messages, is that sometimes illnesses or setbacks are apparent. Because we aim for the healing that he wants to bring in through us. We appreciate that we can understand that faith is a journey. And it's a journey that's been continuing since the dawn of history. The first few verses of chapter 11 of Hebrews tells us that now faith is a substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds, the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Let me read that again. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which were visible. So there's an appreciation of the word wealth framed. Strong's Accordance 2675 is to arrange, to set in order, to equip, adjust, complete what you, that which is lacking, and making fully ready to repair or prepare. The word is a combination of kata, which is down, and artios, which is complete, fitted. It is used for the disciples mending their nets and for the restoring of fallen brother or sister. Now, the author here experiences uh, the, the support of the Hebrew he heroes. But not a definition, but a description of how faith works. Because we can always uh, define the word faith, but the description is what he's now speaking of here. And faith establishes that conviction concerning things that are unseen, appreciating the eternal matters of life, and the expected and settled future reward that we that that we that we strive for. The Greek word substance literally means to stand under, which is a technical sense of a title deed. So when we are coming under Christ, we are covered by his love. And through this Greek word of substance, as we've spoken about in the past few messages, to stand under Christ, to stand in Christ gives us 
that technical substitute of title deed. Standing under the claim to a property to support its validity, thus the faith that it is a title deed of things hoped for. But the emphasis that assurance rests through God's promise. There's that word promise again. Faith, hope and love. When we look at faith, hope and love, we can appreciate that God's doing a good thing in and through each and every single one of us. But we've got to appreciate it from those that went before us. How they journeyed through that walk of faith. Those Israelites that went through the wilderness, or even before then, Noah building the ark, or even before that, then Abraham walking with the Lord by faith. Hebrews 11 verses 8 to 12 speaks of this. The faithful Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise. As in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. The hearers with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations. Whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. As she bore a child she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as a deed, we were born as many as the stars in the sky, in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the sh seashore. <laughs> oh, and it just reminds me of uh, a testimony, looking up at the stars, not knowing exactly what was going to happen in the future, but just looking at the stars and just looking at the Word and what the Word says about it, and sometimes only reading later on about His promises. Look up to the stars. That's what He said to Abraham. Count the stars. It's an appreciation of what He did all those years ago and that promise that was made to Abraham. Father of nations, father, father of multitudes. And here we are today, so many thousands and thousands of years later, appreciating our heavenly hope. Our heavenly hope is given in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through to 15. This now speaks not only of faith, but hope. And although receiving the partial fulfillment, of what God promised, the elders maintained their faith that God would do what he said he would do. And Joseph expressed complete faith in the promise concerning the land of Canaan and spoke of a departure from Egypt centuries into the future. So when we speak that word of life, when we speak that word of encouragement, we are, we are paving the way for the current and future generations to stand in that promise. To stand in the eternal inheritance that is given to them, should they choose. Let's read what it says. These all died in faith, and not having received the promise, but having seen them far, far off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed them that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out of, they would have had an opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And we're going to go in a little bit later about this, appreciating the, the city of God. But that hope that gives them that assurance of, of things not seen, Walking by faith, not by sight, gives us the assurance of what we are journeying towards. Giving us that hope and that faith. The faith like Moses. Faith like Moses who could influence, who could influence such a great choice through these passages of scripture. By faith, Moses, when he was born, he was hidden three months in his parents, by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child. 
and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Now when we look towards the eternal inheritance that we have, we can appreciate that he does all good things in and through us. Only godly faith can see the invisible. And when we appreciate that we can see the unseen, we can step into that assurance that God is speaking to us. He's leading us. He's guiding us. You know, even Rahab's faith was based on the record, the record of God's mighty deeds through that period of time and promises to Israel. That's found in Joshua 2, verses 11, 9 to 11. So there's a lot of faith. There's a lot of hope. But the love is the one who is the author. That is God. And when we continue to hold our, our, our hope and our faith in him, knowing that he is the author of our faith and hope, we can rest assured that he will lead us into the way. By faith, all the great men that we had before us, they overcame. So when we experience that faith, when we experience that uh, revelation, revelational truth of what God is saying to us and uh, experience his, his re revealing nature of the service of uh, our love towards him and others and overcoming all the challenges of life, the shortcomings and the victories through the, overcoming all these things because they looked away from themselves and they looked towards the greatness of God that allowed them to appreciate that when they were in a, a period of need, God could provide. You know, faith, as we, as we all know, sometimes means facing hardships, facing difficult things in life that we that we'd rather not go through, the trials, the tragedies. And one thing that we can be assured of, by faith, we can walk through these things with knowing that he's with us. Whether it's an illness, a decision, a loss, we know that he can walk through every situation with us. As long as we keep our hearts pure to him, lovingly towards his good and pleasing will and nature, whether or not going through these things, just remain faithful. That's all I'm, I'm trying to share with us today is that uh, through difficult times, if we remain faithful to him, then that's, that's a good thing because he says, abide in me and I'll abide in you. You know that the same faith that delivers some from death, from certain death, you know, illness or an accident, a near accident. That same faith that keeps us from that death enables others to die in victory. So when we have faith, we have faith to face circumstances that could lead to death, but also give us the assurance that we can have faith to beat that last, have that last victory. And that last victory is over death. And, you know, I'm speaking to those that have, have lost loved ones. Be assured that the final victory has been won and they can rest in peace. For those that have loved ones or who are facing life-changing um, choices or decisions, have faith because God will walk through every step of the way with us, with the, with the individual choosing or deciding what to do, as well as those around them having the faith that he will be victorious in all things, leading us into the eternal heavenly sanctuary. You know, faith isn't a bridge over troubled waters, but it is a bridge towards peace. And if we picture that bridge, how can that offer some solutions and some opportunities to say yes to be victorious. 
let God's perspective become our focus of faith. Instead of looking at our own perspective of faith, we look at God's perspective of faith in, in, in all these things. And when you overcome certain situations through faith, let that be a testimony to build each other's uh, faith, their own faith up. You know, the last message that we shared, we spoke of a special place in Israel, Hebron, where Abraham, Isaac and Jacob spent some of their lives and no fewer than six Old Testament saints were buried there. Some of those didn't receive the blessing of the promise. As we believe and have experienced in Christ's atoning work. Because they passed long before you lived. But to be made perfect, this is what the eternal reward is. The body of Christ, we are his body, will be made perfect through his love his work, and His Holy Spirit in and through every single one of us. So whether you are facing an impossible situation, whether you are waiting for God to speak to you like Habakkuk, or whether you're taking that step of faith, know that the Lord sees you. He is with you, and He is protecting you. All we have to do is pray in these circumstances. Be accountable, if needs be, but appreciating that we share the same opportunity that both the Old Testament saints, as well as the New Testament believers, can experience. It's that eternal love and the eternal destination that he has for us. I go to prepare a place for you. So let's just have a look at a couple of things here. When we look, it's a graphic word from Strong's Accordance 578, combining apo, which is away from, and blepo, blepo, to see. The word literally means to look away from everything else in order to look intently on one object. Moses looked away from the wealth of the world system towards a messianic future. So as we look, we look up, <laughs> as per the last message, we keep looking up and we keep trusting. We keep holding to our faith and we keep the concept of faith alive, which is the power and promises of God's word. And this is what we're going to finish off on today. The biblical definition, we understand these defining issues that qualify a meaning for faith. This exceeds humanism and avoids more subjective philosoph philosoph philosophical ideas. The concept of faith according to God's word entails entrusting that, number one, the entire creation, visible and invisible, is the result of the creator's direct, intelligent action and not the product of blind chance. Number two, historical figures have encountered this creator in personal ways, evidencing he is more than merely a force and that he is a personal God who relates to those who seek him in providential and redemptive ways. And number three, any worthy approach to God with true faith must believe these two propositions. If faith is to have a starting place, and a realized goal. So as we continue to walk by faith and not by sight with the hope that, that is um, secured, anchored in his love, and love being him, because God is love, we appreciate all these beautiful little nuggets that help us walk by faith, to live by faith, to bring others into his kingdom, to see what the Lord is saying and doing, making sure that we are attuned to his word, attuned to his promptings by the Holy Spirit, and exercising it, applying it in areas that we feel the Lord is calling us to. So as we close off today, I just want to encourage you this week, is continue 
stepping in to what God has called you to. Be sure to go into the scripture. Spend time with him like Habakkuk did. And then reveal his good and pleasing nature to others when he starts revealing it back to you. So that you can be encouraged through the testimony of how he's working in and through not only your lives, but loved ones. If you want to pray for someone, put them on your prayer list. Watch what God does. Because it's him that's going to get the glory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We know that you are a good, good father. We love you. We know that your son went to die on that cross to reveal his good and pleasing will to us, as well as to show his Holy Spirit to us, in, even in these days, to allow us to explore, adventure, appreciate what he does and what he did before going to the cross. And as it said in his word, I will, I will pour out my spirit. We ask that that reconciliation and restoration may come at the time that's pleasing to you. Lord, help us pray for our leaders, pray for our church elders, pray for those that are needing to see you and feel you and experience you. Allow them to turn from any thoughts that are not pleasing to you or any deeds or any actions, aligning their hearts and minds towards you in faith, hope and love so that they may be able to continue their journey with you. So as we close off today, Lord, I pray blessings over everyone, everyone. I pray a period of mercy so that we can get pure and become holy like you are holy. Not that we can be holy like you because you are perfect. But we know that we love you and we will continue journeying, not only individually but collectively, towards the assurance and the hope that we have in you. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, sending you lots of love. And then we'll send another message to help you during this week. But by all means, be encouraged. Go through these scriptures again. Ask the Lord to reveal to you which one he's highlighting to you. And allow him to work in and through you, through what he's revealed to you through this message, or even during your own time. Just exploring your love with your Heavenly Father, the intimacy that you have with him. Until the next time, sending you love.